Good morning. Everyone well? Good, good. It's a little bit one-sided today. Everyone's favouring alcohol on Miriam's side. Actually, I hurt my neck at the gym this week. Um, so if I don't look too much to you guys, it's limited range of motion. It's not anything to do with not looking pretty enough. It's, uh, it's because of that. So I feel like I'm falling a bit. So I've also got a bit of tinnitus. Has anyone suffered from tinnitus before? Just one or two. Oh, it's awful, isn't it? I went to the doctors. Oh, all good, sorted. I've had it for about eight weeks. Finally got some medication for it. She says, why did you not phone in sooner? She didn't like my joke. I says, well, I did. I phoned the tinnitus helpline, but it just kept ringing. <laughs> so um, this morning I'm going to um, preach or bring a word on Ecclesiastes, um, mainly because that's what I've been studying for about the last month, so it's the most fresh and um, thing on my mind at the moment, but there's just so much wisdom and um, guidance and teaching in this book. It's actually became one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, and you probably notice that I preach mostly on the Old Testament. Uh, I think I figured out why that is. Because generally they're quite miserable. They just say it how it is. And um, yeah, they're just, they seem to get up to all sorts of trouble and mischief. And, if, and then on the other hand, you've got the New Testament, which is all grace and fruits of the Spirit. And I don't think that fits me too well. I must admit, I'm quite a harsh person, apparently, at home. I get told that I'm multiple times I'm grumpy, harsh, and need to um, be more general. So maybe I should start investing some time reading in the New Testament. Who knows what the next sermon's going to bring. Um, but Ecclesiastes is a very unique book. It's written by Solomon, who also wrote the book of Proverbs. And he um, tells us in Proverbs many great things and wise things that if we apply that teaching and counsel to our life, we'll be very successful. And he wrote a, a, verse, or a verse in there that says that if we, um, we should seek first the kingdom of God and everything should be added and all these um, amazing scriptures of promise and excitement and hope. Um, but then you get to the next book in the Bible, which is Ecclesiastes, and his tone is so much different. In fact, he says, everything in life is meaningless. And here I am preaching <laughs> on a, my favorite topics are, I mean, everything's meaningless. But you'll learn something today about what this translation of meaningless means, and it's actually very, very interesting. So as we read or listen through um, Ecclesiastes, it's quite helpful to possibly look at this like, although there's one person teaching us, there's two voices speaking to us. So the first half of Ecclesiastes is very much about the, the doom, if you like, and the, um, everything's meaningless and pointless. Uh, and then we get to the middle of the book, and then everything's about fearing God and how life can be so much better when we look at things from that point of view. So I'm going to cover a little bit of both. Um, I will try and keep it as enthusiastic and full of life as possible, despite um, how some of the verses might read. Um, so the first point that is covered in Ecclesiastes is the march of time, how generations come and generations go, but the earth remains. It's been here long before us, and it will be here long before those who come after us. And it says that no one remembers the generations from long ago, and all the people yet to come, they too will be forgotten by those who come after them. He then moves on to a second observation, is that we will not live forever. We all face the same out outcome. At some point, our light will go out. Uh, people who made sacrifices to God and people who did not, we all share the same destiny. Uh, and the third observation on this book is that life has a random nature. How the race doesn't always belong to the swift or the battle doesn't always belong to the strong. 
time and chance happen to them all. His point being that they can't really, we can't control anything in our life. It's just way too unpredictable to try to master. Um, and if we did try, we'd just be setting ourselves up for a fall. So, I never started my timer. Sorry, Aaron. I've been <laughs> Let me start this. Um, there we go. Over um, 40 times, Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes that life is meaningless. If you read uh, Solomon, uh, Ecclesiastes, sorry, before you were a Christian, if somebody <laughs> gave you the book of Ecclesiastes and said, read that, tell me where you think this guy is from and where he wrote it from, you would definitely say Fife. <laughs> In fact, I think if Solomon was to sit amongst one of us, just, well, all of us just now, he maybe would fit right in as well, because he might um, have some of his um, mindset and attitude towards things might not differ too much from how we can often think about life um, when we try our best to live a, a very positive um, mindset. Often we can um, focus um, on something not so positive. I got around this morning because we bought a new loaf of Jason's sourdough protein bread. Man alive, honestly, you have to try Jason's sourdough protein bread. It's like 15 grams of protein in each slice if you're looking um, for some protein. Um, but it just, it's delightful. It's they're like that thick. But the problem is it's like two pound a loaf and it goes in our house. It just goes in moments. I only got it yesterday and there's like two bits left. And I said, Sarah, wow, that's fairly wet. And she's like, oh, here we go again. Is that another complaint? I just said, no, I just mean that we obviously really like Jason's sourdough bread. Easy to misinterpret what somebody means. But over 40 times, Solomon uses that expression that life is meaningless. Now, let me read this to you. It's a Hebrew word that translates in English to smoke or vapor. Like smoke, life can be described as beautiful and mysterious. It takes one shape, and before you know it, it takes a new shape. Smoke looks solid, but try and grab it, and it will slip right through your fingers. And when you're stuck in the thick of it, like fog, you struggle to see clearly. Our modern translations have lost the metaphor, and they usually translate the word as meaningless. What Solomon is saying is rather than life has no meaning, more that it means that the meaning is never clear. Like smoke, life can be confusing, disorientating, and uncontrollable. So what are we meant to do with all of this? Well, Ecclesiastes encourages us to learn wisdom and to live in the fear of the Lord. And secondly, since you can't control life, you should stop trying. Learn to hold things with an open hand because you really only have control over one thing. And that's our attitude to the present moment. Stop worrying as some guidance and choose to enjoy a good conversation with a friend or the sun on your face while in the garden or at the park with the kids or a good meal with people that you care about. The simple things in life the good and the bad, because both are a rich gift from God. Um, I thought that one sentence there um, where it says that we should, we can control one thing, and that's our attitude in the present moment. We have the control of how we react or respond to what we have just now. It does also say stop worrying. You'll know these are not my words because I am not very good at not worrying. In fact, I have self-diagnosed myself as an overthinker. And I don't think I'm the only overthinker. Is there any other overthinkers in the room? Absolutely. I'm the type of overthinker that if somebody um, has a difference of opinion on driving and they give me a little wave, but not in a friendly manner, I will eat away at me for days thinking, what did I do? I'm sure I did it right, and why would they do that? And, um, or if something happens at work and it comes, it looks like, you know, the old famous one, you send an email with the best intentions, oh my goodness, it does not get received. 
with the best intentions. I will sit and worry about it for days and days and days. So much so that um, my dentist has picked up for quite a while that my teeth are wearing down too much. Um, and it's because I grind. And I grind so much that I was even grinding my teeth sitting there because I'm coming up to do this. I'm one of these overthinkers and have I prepared enough? Is it ready? Will it come across well enough? And I grind and grind. And I have to wear, this is not a joke, I have to wear, I'm supposed to wear a gum shield to bed at night. Outrageous. My daughters call it false teeth. You put in your false surgeon. So I just shouldn't tell them the real reason. It's because your mum batters me in her dreams. Like, but uh, I'm an overthinker, so stop worrying is what advice we're given, but it's not always easy to apply it. But yet, we have the uh, ability to control how we are, our attitudes towards the present moment. Um, so this is um, surprising wisdom of Ecclesiastes, listening to the critic, if you like, that speaks can seem dark and painful as he dwells in the gloomier side of life. But then towards the end of the book, we have that second voice, which is like the author speaks up at the end of the book. And this is what he wants for us when we read Ecclesiastes. He doesn't want you to lose hope. He wants to make us humble into someone who trusts that life has meaning, even when you can't make sense of it. That one day God will clear the hevel, the meaninglessness, the smoke, the vapor, and bring his justice on all that we've done. So the proper response to all of this is to fear the Lord and keep all of his commands. So the main message um, is within those words, and I've just picked Proverbs 5 because I could have like, picked something from them all, but I decided to pick Proverbs 5. It does mainly cover the, the topic of work, but we all have that in common, don't we, because we, we, we work to feed our families and pay our bills. So I'm going to split this, so it's Proverbs 5, and it is verse 8 down to 20, but I'm going to split it into two and show a little video in between. And try and remember when you're listening to this that it doesn't mean everything is meaningless, it just doesn't maybe have uh, a meaning that seems clear enough. So Proverbs 5, how meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to you to help you spend it. Every dad right now is shaking his head in agreement with that. Um, so what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? People who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. There is another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Money is put into risky investments that turn sour, and everything is lost. In the end, there is nothing left to pass on to one's children. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us, and this too is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than when they came. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. The world's message, there's an excellent album on it. I used to listen to it in my heyday, but I've moved on from those days. It was called Get Rich or Die Trying. It's uh, what everyone's trying to do. I don't know if you watch the Apprentice TV program. Does anyone watch that? Where they all think they're um, God's gift to the business world, and they have the ideas to make Lord Sugar, millions and millions, uh, and usually they're, they're quite uh, unique characters to say the least. Um, but we have this um, society and mindset to um, have as much as possible, to gain as much as possible, to be as rich as possible, to have a big house, um, one to make people envious, uh, a fancy car, and all the rest of it. Um, the message of the world, and, and um, most people um, can become ruthless and selfish, and you maybe see it in your workplace, they'll um, try and elevate themselves and step on others to climb the corporate ladders. Um, as the, a lot of people, 
would be fair to say, are striving to be the most successful. And research shows us that this is, in fact, as Solomon says, like chasing the wind. When you get there, there is nothing there. The journey may offer the buzz, but the results are not what we expect. And that's what happened to Solomon as well. God blessed him with wisdom. He was the wisest and richest man on earth. And he started well and ended not so well. And he um, became a man who chased after the worldly pleasures. He had uh, multiple wives. He built properties and had animals. He had everything, but he could never find satisfaction. He had um, everything in the world and still f concluded that life is meaningless. Now, I don't know about you. I mean, I would personally like to try out for myself. I'd like to be the richest in the world, buy some new clothes or um, tidy up some things in the house. But um, it doesn't always come as we think it might, as we can learn from that. Now, any Olympics fans? Yeah. My daughters have been stretching quite a lot recently, doing gymnastics, and, um, so, and uh, this is a miracle. We had a miraculous return to swimming lessons yesterday. No fight, no challenge, can I go? And I was like, wait a minute, we were just watching that last night. So, very, very impressed how the Olympics is inspiring my children. But Adam Peaty is a, a swimmer. Did anyone see him last night? He won the semi-final heats in tonight, about quarter to nine, or 8.44 to be precise. He's performing in the men's final. Um, and when you do sermon prep, you're always looking for ideas and inspiration and something to add to your sermon. Um, and yesterday, I went out for a walk, and when I came back and sat down with the girls, we put the Olympics on, and right at that moment was a, a, an interview, or a bit of a, the program was on Adam Peaty. And the first thing I noticed was the cross tattooed across his chest with the words saying into the light. So I just did a bit of digging and research and seeing if I could find anything. And I stumbled across this video and it fits so well because this is a man who currently has won multiple gold medals. He's an Olympic um, hero. Um, he's got fame and popularity. But yet, look how it affected him and listen out to how he managed to get out of being in that mindset of stuck in anxiety and a, a few other mental health struggles. So if you could play that for us, please, Clara, it would be awesome. I love about it, but I am at peace, and uh, uh, the results will be what they will be, uh, but I'm glad that I've enjoyed the journey so far, uh, but now it'll be all about tightening the bolts uh, to make sure that we go to Olympic Games in prime condition. He returns to the pool for his first major meet since he went public about his recent struggles with mental health. I've been doing it 19 years without much break. You know, being an athlete is 365, 24-7, and you'll never have that kind of normal aspect of life. And that just broke me in half. And literally I had tears in this pool because I was like, I'm broken. I don't want to do it. This is not worth it. Because you're, if you're in the bottom of the bottom and your soul is just down there and you're waking up, and you don't want to wake up. It's like, okay, what, what is actually this causing me that is meant to be causing something the complete opposite, but it's not. So if we're going to go to the Olympics, you've got to write a contract with yourself, sign the contract, but also know if you're going to pay the cost, is that cost going to be worth it? And to deal with the price and the pressures of the pool, he says his Christian faith has helped him. I spent most of my life kind of validating or getting my gratification or my life's kind of uh, fulfillment from my results. And that led me to some dark moments. And then it's really living your life on a quantifiable measure of results, 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 instead of how are the people around me? <laughs> how am I? How's my son? How's my family? All these things that actually do matter. It's not just about your job. It's not just about performance. And to get that, I found it, the only place I found it was at church. The only peace is every Sunday in my week because that gives me a, a nice balance. Hello. There you go, Adam Peter. You can cheer him on tonight. Pray for him, I'm sure. For I mean, he won. Um, he holds the world record. So this man, you may think, has got it all: uh, Olympic world record holder, 
And there he says, tears in the pool um, reached a point of breaking. And what became important to him was what's in the moment, his kids or his kids, um, his family, spending time with friends. And most of us wonder what life would look like if we could be superstars and rich and wealthy. And there's somebody who has it and is telling us that in fact, his um, peace comes from knowing God first and foremost, but then being aware of the goodness of God in his life and his, his, child, his child and friendship and families. Um, so we mentioned work, but I often think one thing that probably also affects us all is we get frustrated at things a lot of the time. I know we do. Um, I'm sure even most families may be coming, not to this church, but any church, trying to get kids ready and on time and not be judged for being late and all the rest of it. <laughs> that burden that we carry. <laughs> um, they, they we get frustrated and stressed, um, possibly over finances and wishing we had more and spending our time thinking and, and these and are stuck in a mindset, if you like, but it seems unclear, and uh, getting anxious and short and maybe preferring to be at work than be at home with the family or not wanting to spend time and all these um, magical moments that are, that are available and with us just now. And sometimes, not just like the work situation, but we can also um, get a little bit misguided and off course with that as well. I mean, you know, it doesn't, anyone who's had kids, when you see how fast that they grow up and how quick um, seasons pass to try and capture the beauty of that moment, even through the sleepless nights or the times when they're ill and the struggles that we go through as parents or grandparents and um, to, to, to take these verses and to try and analyze life through that. Um, so moving on to verse 18, things do get a little bit more um, uh, happier sounding, if you like. Verse 18 says, even so, I have noticed one thing, at least that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them, and to accept their lot in life. And it is good to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. And there's another verse that I haven't added, I couldn't tell you what it is, but it tells us that looking back in the past is actually not good for us either. Sometimes you might look back and think, when I had all that money, my life was simpler. <laughs> it doesn't do us any good. Um, so God wants us to view what we have, whether it is much or little, with the right perspective. Our possessions are a gift from God. And although they are not the source of joy, they are a reason to rejoice because every good thing comes from God. We can be content with what we have when we realize that in God we have everything. I think one of those slides, what are they, they go, our hearts are restless until we rest in the finding our true peace and um, contentment and uh, our purpose of life. Um, there is a book that I read, you're probably going to think I am the most miserable person in Fife at the moment, but I read this book about a year ago and it's called The Five Regrets of the Dying. <laughs> I love an audio book when I'm driving, uh, and for some reason this book just jumped out at me, and um, to hear what people who have reached the end stages of their life, what they, how they analyze and assess, and it's written by a nurse who used to look after them. I think her name is Bronnie Ware, uh, she's Australian. If you like a good soothing Australian accent like Michael gets to enjoy all the time, <laughs> unless Hannah's frustrated and flustered, um, you can listen to this audio book and be um, relaxed and listen um, to this very nice 
um, accent. However, it is a little bit, there's parts of it that do come across a bit new agey and um, things we don't, don't agree with, but the main um, purpose of the book is to obviously just let us think about things and learn the wisdom which we're encouraged by Solomon to do, learn wisdom from other people. Um, and so the top five, I won't go through them, the first one blew me away, absolutely shocked me. It says, I wish I had spent more time and money buying my husband a Man United season ticket holds and letting him go freely to every second home game at Manchester United. I mean, when God anoints a book and just points you right to it, you just know it's the leading of the Holy Spirit. So, Sarah. <laughs> All right, the second, that wasn't the first, obviously. The second one is the one I'm going to touch on. And it's quite an obvious one. And it says, I wish I didn't work so hard. And I bet you probably would have imagined that one would have been in the top five. I wish I didn't work so hard. And she shares two or three, maybe even more, um, stories, if you like, about patients that she cared for, their background, how they got to where they were at. Some people younger and um, they are through bad choices and others who have just been fortunate to live a long life. But there was this one man called John who was married to Margaret and a father of five. Now, I didn't add this to make you dwell on the topic. I, add, I purposely put this in so that we could just take the last paragraph, the, 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 the last words of wisdom from this man and just hear what he says. But just to give you a background of how his life was, when all the children left home, Margaret asked John to retire. They had enough money behind them to retire well, but John always argued that they may need more, and Margaret insisted they could sell their now too big house if needed and buy some more suitable and, uh, property and free up more money. Margaret was lonely and longed to discover their relationship again without children or work. Margaret had a desire to travel and would devour holiday brochures, dreaming of all the places she'd love to visit with her husband. John also had a desire to travel as well, but he also enjoyed the status his work gave him. He didn't particularly like the work itself, just the role that it gave him in society with his friends. The chase of closing the deal had become an addiction for him in business. One evening, with Margaret in tears, he looked at his beautiful wife and realized that not only was she desperately lonely for his company, but they were both old people now. This wonderful woman had waited so patiently for him to retire. In this moment, it was the first time that John considered that they were not going to live forever. John finally agreed to retire, and Margaret was so excited, her tears switched from sadness to joy. But the smile didn't last long when he added, in one more year. There was a new deal being neg negotiated in the company and he wanted to be a part of it and see it through. She had waited 15 years for him to retire. Surely she could wait one more. John later admitted that he felt, felt guilty even then but couldn't retire without the buzz of one more deal. Margaret began planning trips with travel agents so she would make her husband sorry Margaret began planning trips with travel agents and she would make her husband dinner every night from him returning home from work and they would sit at the table that once held their family of five children John was now warming to the idea of retiring too but insisted on sticking to the year plan to see deals through four months and to his acceptance to retire, Margaret became to feel a bit nauseous. And after a week, it had not passed, so she visited the doctor. Assuming that it would be something silly and nothing to worry about. However, Margaret's symptoms worsened and they were shocked to discover that Margaret was in fact dying. She passed away three months before John was due to retire. 
Many years later, John was now living with deep regret. John loved his work and loved the status, but what's the point of, na of that now, he says? He gave less time to tr what truly kept him going in life. His beloved Margaret had given him an abundance of support and was always there for him. But John admits he was not there for her. John, John's retirement had been plagued with guilt. And this is a paragraph, his final words, if you like, before he passed, analyzing and reflecting on the missed opportunity of a happy retirement with his wife. John admitted he had been scared to retire as his role had become a way to define him in life. In John's final weeks, he asked the question of why do we depend on the material world to validate us? There is nothing wrong with wanting a better life. It's just that the chase for more and the achievements and belongings can hinder us from real things like time with those we love, time doing things we love ourselves, and balance. Those were the final words in the, in the book anyway. I, I imagine that wasn't the end, but he analyzed and had to live with that. And uh, I wanted to add it just because Ecclesiastes is telling us to be mindful of the moment that we have the, the um, power, if you like, to um, be in the present moment and enjoy everything that we have that's a gift from God and to try and not spend our time worrying about things out with our control, possibly finances and situations and um, all sorts of different worries, but to, to learn from um, Solomon's um, Ecclesia book of Ecclesiastes and take what God wants us um, to hear. Um, see where we're at. I think we're about done anyway, so yeah. There's also a, 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 another short story I would encourage you to listen. I won't go into it too much, but it's the, the parable of the Mexican fisherman. Has anyone heard that one? It's just in my dark research of books, I stumbled across another one. Definitely worth a listen about a man um, who's uh, chilling out on the beach and he's done his day's work and made his money and some businessman comes along and says, how's your day, what have you been up to? And he tells him he's made all um, some money and now he's chilling out and he's going to go home and have dinner with his family and take his wife out for a glass of wine and the man says, wow, you've made quite a catch today. He says, do you know, if you stayed out working longer and later, um, you'd make more money than you could invest in a bigger fishing boat. And once you start to accumul accumulate more money, you could buy a fleet of boats and this can continue and eventually you can um, sell your business and make millions and the Mexican fisherman says and and then what would I do and he says well you could sit on the beach and enjoy the sun you could take your wife for a glass of wine you could spend time with your kids and the point of the story is we have that now and in our grasp and uh, it's a gift from God in the present and uh, in the moment and not to get sidetracked by trying to achieve and strive and build because God wants us to take care of the gifts that he has given us. I'm just going to finish with one, two final verses. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. That's the whole story. Here is now my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. My study notes then added that we should recognize that human effort apart from God is futile. That secondly, we should put God first. Thirdly, we should receive everything good as a gift from God. And four, realize that God will judge every person's life, whether good or evil. And then it finishes with a striking sentence. How strange that people spend their life striving for the joy and satisfaction that God freely gives us. Ecclesiastes 9, 7 to 10. So go ahead, eat your food with joy, and drink your wine with a happy heart, for God approves of this. Wear fine clothes and a splash of cologne, aftershave, perfume. Live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. 
the wife God gives you as your reward for all your earthly toil. Whatever you do, do well. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. Finished there, guys. That's the book of Ecclesiastes. I would encourage you to read it. It's 12 chapters. Um, if you've got a study Bible, even better, because you can dive into it. Um, and just to um, make sense of what he means when he says everything is meaningless. So uh, I don't know if the band want to come back up. And uh, I, I normally pick a song. They were just, they were all amazing, weren't they? All, all four songs. Like, I don't, I don't have a preference. But... Um, yeah, if we want to come up and um, I'll hands back over to Alan there.